At first sight, this might appear to be another prehistoric monument secluded, tucked away in the British countryside. But actually, after places like Stonehenge and Avebury, this is one of the best loved and most visited sites in the whole of Britain. This is the Rollwright Stones in Oxfordshire. And one of the most remarkable things about one of our most visited sites is that we hardly know anything about them. Somehow, our understanding of one of our most visited sites has never really moved far beyond a whole load of mumbo jumbo mythology. The best known of these stories is how the individual elements get their names and in many ways is their whole identity. The King's Men, the King's Stone and the Whispering Knights. All men turn to stone by a witch. Now I could tell you the story or I could tell you all the other stories that have been written through the centuries. The point is that all these stories turn our minds away from what these monuments were actually all about. The earliest reference to the stones comes from the 14th century when the locals called it Rolandrith. But it wasn't until 1586 that the antiquarian William Camden actually described them. He wrote about the large boulders arranged in a circle and he went on, they are unshaped, unmatched, much diminished and corroded by the passage of long years. Through the following few hundred years, a number of antiquarians and researchers tossed their findings and opinions into the mix. Camden himself attributed them to the Danish King Rollo, suggesting that they were a memorial to his battle victory. And that story stuck for well over a century. Then in the 17th century, there was John Aubrey, he of the Aubrey Holes at Stonehenge. And it was he who kicked off the idea that these places were built by the Druids. And Robert Plot, who still held the Danish King Rollo explanation. And Thomas Brown. And Inigo Jones. There were loads of them, and they did like to disagree with each other. Things didn't get any clearer in the 18th century when William Stukeley, arguably the most prolific and famous antiquarian of them all, took John Aubrey's notion of the Druids and pushed it beyond all reason. He even made up all manner of elaborate stories and published them as fact. And arguably, all the modern-day association of any prehistoric site with Druid culture came from Stukeley's overzealous banging of his favourite drum, which is, after all, based on nothing factual whatsoever. Now, obviously, I don't need to be telling you stories. I need to be telling you what we know, however scant and fragmented that may be. And in fairness to William Stukeley, his ideas weren't so outrageous, considering the information and knowledge of the time. Where Stukeley excelled was in his fieldwork, and his engravings of the site do give us an idea as to how the stones have fared, and how people appear to have grown rather a lot in the last few hundred years. But as the 18th century rolled into the 19th, the discipline of archaeology as a science was beginning to take hold and verifiable facts took over from subjective opinion. The simple fact is that all around the Rollwright stones we have evidence for people. Lives lived. A settlement. Which should come as no surprise at all. A stone circle is always going to be near a settlement. And a settlement is always going to hold every aspect of life, living and death. Any excavations could uncover all manner of items from all aspects of human existence. The land is littered with traces of things long gone. Barrows and buildings long since erased by ploughing. Stukeley wrote about a square structure in the field to the east of the King's Stone, double ditched with the soil from the ditches thrown up to raise a terrace, the inner section having the remains of stone walls. 
Well, that's what 250 years of farming does for you. Moving into the 20th century and on to the present, it's certainly true that work has been done, and the findings have revealed nothing surprising at all. A lot of worked flint, axes, arrowheads, some pieces of pottery, but these were all found throughout the settlement. We still have nothing tangible that gives us a genuine date for the monuments themselves. The history of confusion wasn't helped by this long mound near the Kingstone. Whilst the subject of constant debate, even since Stukeley's time, it had predominantly been thought that this was a long barrow. It isn't. In fact, although a barrow burial was found, the mound is essentially natural. We want answers, but everything that comes back is vague. Mostly, it has to be said, because the major excavations and necessary lab work have never been done. So what we have are rough ideas gleaned from circumstantial evidence. It's probably fair to say that these whispering knights are all that remains of a Neolithic portal dolmen from around 3000 BC. This would be the blocked entrance, and the mound would have extended backwards, tapering as it went, its size dictated by the scale of the community. But as it has all been ploughed away and most of the stones robbed to be used for other purposes, they don't even give us a clue as to how big that community may have been. And the King's Stone. You know, this bizarre shape is the result of far more recent superstitious folks chipping pieces off as charms and talismans. The engravings from over the centuries show clearly how its size has diminished, chip by superstitious chip, over the last 300 years. It's thought that it could be a burial marker because of the amount of graves found nearby. Maybe. If that's true, it would most likely make it later than the circle by as much as a thousand years. Other ideas of the stone as having an astronomical significance or being a marker for the circle, maybe. The circle itself was restored in the 19th century, but fortunately, from old engravings, most notably by a chap called Logan in 1677, we can tell which stones were still standing, and it is as good as certain that it did form an unbroken ring, with the stones actually touching, and one or two possible entrances. The generally accepted date for the circle is around 2,500 years BC. But that date, although not unreasonable, is not based on any scientific reading, but is suggested merely because the style of this circle resembles the Cumbrian circles like Swinside, which are 200 miles to the north of here. But whether or not this idea is correct, the possibility of a cultural connection in turn led to the idea that it may have been a centre for axe trading. Now that idea is supported by its position on a ridgeway on a known trade route running down the spine of Britain. So what have we got? Well, until a major excavation is undertaken with all the relevant lab analysis, what we have is a site occupied by a thriving community for thousands of years, continuing into the Roman era and beyond. Even Anglo-Saxon artefacts have been found here. Apart from that, our knowledge is scant, but we have an absolute wealth of folklore. My point is simply that we have story after story after story. We may come to visit the site and having been told magical tales of witchcraft or romantic stories of druids, we leave satisfied, no longer yearning for more. So do we want facts or do we want stories? Perhaps more than any other site, the Rollwright Stones tells us less about our ancestors and the purposes of all these structures are more about ourselves and what we'd like our ancient monuments to be.
Hi, Michael Bott here. Thank you for watching this video. I do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please consider becoming one of our valued Patreon supporters. Just click on the link above, have a look, see if there's a level at which you'd like to support our production of the Standing With Stones podcast, interviews, films like this, and much more. There are lots of perks and rewards to choose from, and for as little as a dollar a month, you can become one of the Standing With Stones team. You might even get a free Standing With Stones baseball cap. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. See you again soon, I hope.